Welcome, I'm Katherine Hadro, and this is a special edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Pro-Life Sea Change. Does the new conservative majority in the Supreme Court spell the end of Roe versus Wade? We explore that question with the experts. They have been so gracious, non-judgmental, and supportive with me from the time that I came in. I've never been treated with, with such respect by any woman or any set of women that I haven't really known. Taking on Planned Parenthood, we focus on a pregnancy center serving women in need and protecting the sacredness of life. We talk to a leading bioethicist about what our laws should look like in a post-Roe world. This is a special edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. With a newly confirmed Justice Amy Coney Barrett and a 6-3 conservative majority in the Supreme Court, the pro-life movement is buzzing about whether we might soon see Roe v. Wade chipped away. Those are the sounds of protests outside the Supreme Court during the Amy Coney Barrett confirmation battle. It's the nation's debate over abortion on display, as a Justice Barrett means the nation's highest court is in possible position to chip away at Roe v. Wade. That is the 1973 Supreme Court ruling that legalized abortion nationwide, the same case that brings tens of thousands of pro-lifers to Washington, D.C. each year for the annual March for Life. With the battle over Roe in the nation's spotlight, we wanted to bring you a special edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly to answer all your Roe-related legal and cultural questions. Kevin Terrio is senior counsel and vice president of the Center for Life for Alliance Defending Freedom. He joins us on Skype now to answer our legal questions surrounding abortion at the courts. Kevin, welcome. First, is it possible to overturn Roe v. Wade? How do you begin to address that big question? Thanks, Catherine. I appreciate you having me on. And yes, it is possible. But the Supreme Court is likely to do it in a series of cases that incrementally begins to undermine Roe and then uh, minimize its reach. And we would expect this to start with a challenge to a pro-life law that doesn't necessarily completely ban abortion, but regulates it in some way like a pre-viability regulation or a eugenics uh, re regulation. Kevin, we always talk about Roe v. Wade and the pro-life movement, can, but can you explain how Planned Parenthood v. Casey in 1992 built upon Roe? Well, uh, Casey was an opportunity to overturn Roe, and, uh, and instead it, it limited Roe in some ways, but uh, the bottom line is, mm -hmm we get our test for whether a regulation of abortion is constitutional um, from Casey. And it essentially is this, that as long as a state is not posing a substantial obstacle to abortion access, um, that regulation is permissible if it's reasonable and relates to uh, a legitimate state interest. So, um, so uh, regulations, even regulations that we saw like in the June medical case this past term um, require, requiring hospital admitting privileges, those can be constitutional, even though the court found that particular one was not. Mm, Kevin, you briefly mentioned this already, but what are potential cases in the pipeline now that would challenge Roe v. Wade? Well, there are several in the pipeline now. As a matter of fact, uh, the Supreme Court will consider uh, a case uh, out of Mississippi in the next week or two, um, the Jackson Women's Health versus Dobbs, which is a, a regulation of abortion prior to, uh, I mean, excuse me, after 15 weeks. And uh, although that case was struck down by the Court of Appeals, uh, the Supreme Court has a chance to consider whether it will take it in the next week or two. There's also um, a great law out of Missouri that's uh, in the pipeline that's being considered by the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals in St. Louis and a law out of Ohio that limits abortion um, and prohibits abortion of uh, Down syndrome people. Um, and, and that's in the 
one too. Both, all of those are great candidates. Wow. Kevin, do you think it is likely with the makeup of the Supreme Court right now that we could overturn Roe versus Wade? Should this be a focus of the pro-life movement? Well, we don't know how justices are going to rule on any particular case in any given case. But what we do know is that um, in the past, uh, the conservative justices, justices have signaled that um, that Roe v. Wade was improperly decided. Even uh, uh, the late Justice Ginsburg um, said that it wasn't decided in the, on the proper rationale. So um, the, the, the decision is ripe for overturning. We think that we have justices in place that um, will understand that things have changed since Roe was decided. We have new technology and uh, that shows the development of the baby. We have new evidence that abortion is harmful to women and, and it's harmful to the medical profession. Absolutely. Well, Kevin Terrio with Alliance Defending Freedom, thank you so much for sharing your legal insight with us and thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me on, Catherine. I appreciate it. Thank you. If Roe versus Wade is ultimately overturned, the work of the pro-life movement becomes more important than ever, and pro-life pregnancy clinics will be on the front lines serving women in need. To get a close-up look of these clinics, I traveled to Sarasota, Florida, and saw firsthand how a pregnancy center is taking on the abortion industry in the state. When I found out I was pregnant, I was distraught. I didn't, I did not know what to do. I didn't know what to think. Um, I didn't know what to tell my mom. I thought my parents were going to be mad at me, you know, um, unwed, um, young. Erica Pompey of Florida shares the same story as so many other women, an unmarried woman who found herself in an unplanned pregnancy. I knew deep down I didn't want to um, have an abortion, but that was the first thing that came to mind. Oh, I can't have this baby. But her story has a happy ending. See, look. Give me look. Give me kisses. I miss Genesis. Um, well, I got her name from the first book of the Bible. And Genesis, is, it's a, such a heavy meaning for me. She's my new beginning. It gives me a chance to do things right, to start over. Baby Genesis was born on Easter Sunday this year, a time of rebirth and renewal. 22-year-old Pompey credits her mother's strong support to saying yes to life and the support from some other women yeah, as well. She's a pretty special little baby. Yes, yes. very special. Yeah. It was at the Community Pregnancy Clinic in Sarasota, Florida, where Pompey got a first glimpse of her daughter from an ultrasound and a surprising gesture from a clinic volunteer. At the end, we were getting ready to leave. Um, Carol prayed with me. That was, oof, that was amazing. That was life changing. I knew then that that's my lifetime friend. The new mom says she texts every day or every other day with the volunteer team, sending pictures and updates still receiving support one year after she first made an appointment. Everyone is grateful it was their clinic doors Pompey walked into, and not the doors next door. Because the Community Pregnancy Clinic here in Sarasota, Florida, sits in the shadow of the state's largest Planned Parenthood. Clinic staff portray it as a David and Goliath matchup. We were able to get this little tiny gray house literally in the shadow of Planned Parenthood. And it's that, that attempt to be that last minute chance. If, if that girl just before she walks in there is willing to say, hey, we'll do an ultrasound for free. We'll give you this help for free. We're right there. And, and we can intervene in that very last second with young women. It's a life-saving strategy. As sidewalk counselors frequently inform abortion-minded women going to Planned Parenthood, about the pro-life pregnancy center just steps away. The clinic is equipped with an ultrasound, an ultrasound van that travels to women most in need, and even recently, Mary's House, a small home next door that will serve as a counseling and educational hub for new moms. Everything patients receive here, from pregnancy and STI tests to new clothes for their babies, is completely free. And young Erica is not the only mom who's recently benefited.
When I found out I was pregnant, it was a complete shock. I wasn't in a relationship. There were multiple factors going on in my life to where I didn't feel like I was ready or, or couldn't take on a child at the time. So it was just it was just a lot of things that were piling on. Rochelle Matheny felt so overwhelmed by her pregnancy earlier this year, she went to a nearby abortion facility. I actually had a, an ultrasound at the abortion clinic, and, and there's a story to this. They had told me within five seconds, you only have one in there. Matheny was early in her pregnancy and decided to take the abortion pill. But hours later, regretting her decision, researched online, it was possible to reverse the effects of that first abortion pill. And Community Pregnancy Clinic was there to help. I looked into that for a few minutes and found that there were pregnancy clinics nearby that could help out. So I called a number at 3.16 in the morning and, and talked to someone, yes, yes. And they were, it's a 24 hour line, they were able, able to help instantly. The abortion pill reversal is progesterone. And so the, when they take the first pill, if they have, uh, if they're able to decide that they don't wanna go through with it, they can call the number, the hotline number, and then get in contact with the nurse, get in contact with the doctor, get the um, progesterone that they need to take, come in for an ultrasound, and make sure that um, everything will progress in a more positive way. When the young pregnant mother came to the pro-life clinic for that ultrasound, she was in for big news not originally shared with her at the abortion facility. When I came in to this clinic, they told me instantly, they were like, you're having twins, which was a complete shock to me, complete shock. So not only had I saved one life, not only was one life important to me, but I found out that there were two. Two. Yeah. We really want the best for them in every way possible, physically, mentally, spiritually. Mary Cousel is a registered nurse and volunteer at this pro-life Florida clinic. Her job here is her reward. It just makes you so happy, you know, like, you know, love is repaid by love alone. So it's like, in or just to help these people and then to see the results just becomes such a, oh, just such a way to keep going. While the neighborhood Planned Parenthood towers in size to this pro-life center, the little gray house that could uses a mercy model every mom deserves. It's the love and mercy that convinced Matheny to choose life twice over. Still early on in her pregnancy, the barely there bump reminds the Florida mother of twins of all she's gained here. And I know I'm meant to be a mother. I've known it for many, many years. It's a, it's a great dream of mine, but it just, at the time, there were so many things coming against me and I didn't really have the support that I needed. The emotional support was the best of all because you never know who's walking into the clinic. You don't know if they don't have some uh, support from their mother, father, extended family, their friends. You don't know how alone they could be. And they really, really seemed to care. They gave me more emotional support than anyone else in my life. To talk about the important role of pregnancy centers in a post-Roe world, we are joined on Skype by two key members of PLAN, which is the Pregnancy and Life Assistance Network. Cheney Mullins is the PLAN Program Manager, and Jill Stanick is the Outreach Manager. Welcome back to both. First, Cheney, can you remind our viewers, what is PLAN? Thank you for having us, Catherine. PLAN is an effort of Susan B. Anthony List's Education Fund and is part of the strategy to prepare for a post-Roe America where we will need to increase the pro-life safety net. We need a plan, a Pregnancy and Life Assistance Network, PLAN, for her. For that mom who would have once turned to abortion that is now needing alternatives. Life-affirming organizations are currently numerous, but they're not connected in a network that's specifically geared to pregnant and parenting women and families. So PLAN facilitates collaboration between assistance providers and their communities in order to empower women and families through comprehensive medical, mm -hmm. social, and material support to meet all their needs. 
Excellent. You, your group's mission, like you said, is to prepare for a post-Roe world. Jill, the last time we spoke, it was before Justice Barrett was confirmed to the high court. From your perspective, are the stakes even higher right now? Are we closer to a post-Roe reality? Yes, no matter what happens with the elections, we now have at least a 5-4 pro-life Supreme Court majority, and that is Alito, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, Barrett, and Thomas, and hopefully a 6-3 majority. John Roberts has become a bit of an unknown, but we hope that he will vote with the majority, realizing that voting with the majority, he'll still lose, and wanting to be on the right side of history. Mm. Cheney, is the pregnancy center movement ready for a post-Roe world? Does the burden fall on local clinics if Roe is overturned? Well, pregnancy centers can't handle a post-Roe world alone. Because imagine when there will be more pregnant moms in need of support to parent or make an adoption plan or in need of foster care for their children while they get back on their feet. And at this moment, as a movement, we're evaluating whether our current organizations are strong enough to handle this influx of women with multiple needs, women that likely need services from many organizations. And the good news is that PLAN is preparing for this by forming that comprehensive network of life-affirming providers. So you have your standard pregnancy centers, adoption agencies, and maternity homes, but also including pro-life doctors, lawyers, child care providers, and even food banks. Mm. Jill, abortion advocates often refer to pro-life pregnancy centers as fake clinics. You previously worked as a nurse. What's your response to that? The reason that abortion proponents are trying to tar pregnancy care centers as fake clinics, um, unsuccessfully, I might add, is because PRCs are one reason for the decimation in the number of abortion clinics. It, they reached their high in 1991 with 2,176, and today they're down to 720, which is a 66% drop. And really, abortion clinics are the real fake clinics. They only show abortion, only show ultrasounds if they're forced to by the law. They prefer ignorance and uninformed consent. They oppose any and all efforts by state legislatures to raise their clinic standards to those of other ambulatory clinics like um, foot doctors. For instance, in Illinois, uh, veterinary clinics and nail salons are more regulated than abortion clinics, and that's the case in many states. So you don't hear of pregnancy care centers being shut down for uncleanliness or gross negligence or expired meds or unlicensed personnel. That's all on abortion mills. Mm. Cheney, can you just briefly expand on the important role these pro-life clinics play in our movement? Well, they serve as an entry point for women who don't know what to do about their pregnancy. Maybe they haven't even come to grips with the fact that they're pregnant. They need loving and compassionate support to talk through their options. And many pregnancy centers also provide ultrasounds so a mom can see her baby, parenting classes and resources when a woman chooses life, and post-abortion care for those that don't. They can really serve as an entry point for a woman that helps facilitate her access to services across all the categories of care. And in a post yeah. America, they will be more important than ever in this role, shifting slightly from helping a Absolutely. woman choose life to becoming a more comprehensive support center. Cheney Mullins and Jill Stanick, thank you so much for your expertise and for your work. God bless you both. Thank, thank you. you. The 1973 Roe v. Wade decision is responsible for over 60 million abortions in the United States alone. Not only is it devastating for our pro-life cause, but the high court ruling was a profoundly undemocratic moment in our nation. For this week's special edition of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly on Roe v. Wade, we turn now to our call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com and sign our petition to denounce Roe v. Wade. Every year at the March for Life, the pro-life movement comes together in the Washington, D.C. winter to peacefully protest this Supreme Court decision. But our repudiation of Roe must go beyond just one day a year. 
pro-life Americans should continue to expose the extremism of this precedent and continue to raise awareness about state pro-life policies that challenge the status quo of Roe. Sign our petition to denounce Roe v. Wade. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com. Coming up, protecting the sacredness of life. If Roe v. Wade is overturned, what should our laws look like next? We talk to one of our nation's leading bioethicists and ask what states should do next to protect the most vulnerable. Welcome back to this special edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. We continue now looking at the question of overturning Roe v. Wade at the Supreme Court. If Roe were to be overturned, what should our laws look like next? Is there a way for our legal system to better protect the sacredness of human life? In his new book, What It Means to Be Human, The Case for the Body in Public Bioethics, Notre Dame law professor Carter Sneed argues that if laws were to reflect the reality of life, they would support the vulnerable, including the unborn, mothers, families, and those nearing the end of their lives. Joining us now on Skype is Carter Sneed. Professor Sneed is one of the world's leading experts on public bioethics. He also directs the Dina Cola Center for Ethics and Culture at the University of Notre Dame, which I've gratefully participated in myself. Carter, congratulations on the release of your new book, What It Means to Be Human. Can you summarize your book's main message? Sure, yeah, and thanks for having me on. It's great to join you today. Uh, the book basically makes two arguments. The first argument is methodological. It argues that the best way to understand law is through the conceptions that underlie the law about what a person is and what human flourishing is and what we owe to each other. And when you look at the law of abortion and assisted reproduction and end-of-life decision-making in America, what you find is a vision of the person that is woefully incomplete, in fact, fatally incomplete, because it doesn't take seriously our embodiment, our unchosen obligations to one another, and certainly to our obligations to the unborn child, to children more generally, the disabled, as well as uh, those who are uh, the elderly. Mm. Carter, what does it mean to be human, and how might the pro-life movement benefit from having a better understanding of this truth as we work to protect human life? Well, if we think about our own lived experience and we realize that not only are we wills and desires and, and, and defined in some ways by our capacity to choose, uh, that's not the end of the story. Unfortunately, our laws take that as the end of the story in defining what a person is and what we owe to each other. But in fact, if you think about what we are, we live, die, experience ourselves and one another as bodies. And because we are bodies, mm -hmm. we are uh, vulnerable, we're mutually dependent, we're subject to natural limits. And that means we need networks of what Alistair McIntyre calls of uncalculated giving and graceful receiving, both to survive and to flourish. And for the law to be just and humane, it needs to be built on that truth so that we can see ourselves as vulnerable and dependent and defined also by virtue of our relationships and obligations and privileges regarding one another and our obligations especially to those who are most vulnerable, including especially the unborn child. Carter, we spoke earlier in this week's show about what it would legally take to pick away at Roe versus Wade. Say that happens. What should states do next to legally protect our most vulnerable? What would those laws look like? Well, it would look very much like what the laws looked like before 1973. Uh, when Roe v. Wade was uh, announced in 1973, abortion was uh, illegal in most states. Uh, of course, women weren't prosecuted for seeking abortions. It, were abor it was abortion providers that were, that were prosecuted. Um, there were exceptions for the life of the mother. But the unborn child's life was recognized. The unborn child's personhood was recognized in the law and, was, and were rightly understood to be part of the moral and legal community. So step one is to restore our, our, our vision of the boundaries of the moral and legal community to include the unborn child and with all the consequences, legal, political, and moral that follow from that. Speaking of the Supreme Court, I know you are a friend and former colleague of now Justice Amy Coney Barrett. What should we know about our newest justice? It's extraordinary to hear that, to hear, I never get tired of hearing the phrase Justice Amy Coney Barrett. I've known uh, Justice Barrett for 16 years. She's a very dear friend. Her family is a dear friend of our family. And I'm telling you, uh, there's not a greater gift to our country in my lifetime 
than the appointment of, of Amy Coney Barrett to the U.S. to the Supreme Court of the United States. She is not only brilliant, everyone knows how brilliant she is, but also she uh, is the most extraordinarily good and generous and humble and honest person uh, that, uh, that I've ever met. Uh, and, uh, and to have her uh, seated on the highest court in the land is an amazing gift, not just for the rule of law, but to us as, as citizens as well. She was going to do an amazing job. She will focus her, uh, her energies as a justice on uh, interpreting the law as it's written and as it was originally understood in the case of the Constitution. And, uh, and as a result, our laws are going to be more just. Our, our civic life is going to be better. Uh, and, uh, and our nation will be healthier. Well, Carter Sneed, thank you for all that you do to build up a culture of life. And congratulations again on the launch of your book, What It Means to Be Human. God bless you. God bless you. That does it for this special edition of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. I hope you're walking away more informed and better equipped for this national conversation on Roe versus Wade. Until next time, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on social media at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. You can also send us a message by emailing prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. We'd love to hear from you. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.